all, and welcome to another episode of Adventuring Academy, the podcast where we talk about all things tabletop and how to run games for you and your pals uh, all throughout the wide, wide world of TTRPGs. I'm your humble dungeon master, Brendan Mulligan. Uh, our guest today, we are so lucky and excited to have her. Uh, she is an author, accessibility advocate, fitness pro, neuroscience grad, D&D &D player, <laughs> and cosplayer. Woo! What a CV. Uh, uh, she plays D&D &D for Fabled 42 on Twitch and also Damsel's Dice and Everything Nice. We are so excited to have her. Please welcome Alicia Marie. Hey, everybody. What's up? What's going on? What's going on? In the middle of a pandemic, hanging out with Brand. I'm excited. <laughs> I know. There we go. This is our miniature virtual convention here to make up for the months and months of pandemic and quarantine. Alicia, how are you doing? I'm doing, you know, honestly, in the beginning, it was definitely more of a culture shock. But this has been, you know, that term that everyone hates on socials, the new normal. It's yeah. we've, I've learned how to move within this this new whatever it is and try to find like little bits of happiness like where I can. <laughs> yes, so, I, yeah. I am right there with you. And uh, we were just talking before we before we jumped on to the program itself. We were talking about convention life. Alicia, I think it's awesome because you've been talking about projects that you were getting ready for conventions, and now we've had been in this non-convention world for a while. I've been going to conventions since I was a wee little kid. My mom, uh, Elaine Lee, uh, a comic book writer. So I've been going to Comic-Con and comic conventions since I was a beansy little guy. Um, talk to me, like, what was your first introduction to kind of like nerd spaces and then to the larger like convention world? Like how did you get involved? And when was your first, do you remember like your first convention? My first, oh my, of course I was actually older when I went to my first convention. I, where I grew up on the East coast and my love of comic books started when I was like nine years old because I fell in love with Wonder Woman and She-Hulk. So yes. both. I like my DC comics and I'm more, and I, but I, I mean, I, I would follow the stories like when I read them, but I mostly fell in love with like how they looked. I was like, they look, they look strong. And back then women weren't flexing back then. That was like, but I wanted to flex. I was like, oh, She-Hulk was like smart. She was a lawyer. She was like a badass. I was like, and Wonder Woman was like, I mean, invincible. And she had that sort of like, I used to say that like, I used to love that Wonder Woman whenever she got mad, she never like grimaced. She sort of would look almost like, you know when a cat turns its nose up at things, sort of like. <laughs> so, yeah. whenever I, so when I was younger, when I would get mad at something, I would just do the Wonder Woman like, like slight disgust. Like, <laughs> I, used to, I just loved it. So that's where I started with comic books. So, I mean, I, I was, I've always been a creative, just a creative kid. I liked making things. My costumes were always, I mean, for a fourth, fifth, sixth grader were always pretty kick butt. I used to win costume contests when I was younger. So I've always been like a creator type. I've always loved like geeky stuff, even though back in the day, it wasn't something you bragged about. It was something you got picked on for. Hey, I remember that a hundred percent. It's a very, it's, it's, uh, it almost feels anachronistic now because now I feel like nerd culture and pop culture are completely interchangeable. Like movies go to get their big buzz started at Comic Con. It is like the marriage of like mainstream, you know, again, popular culture and these like nerd spheres. That's what I think there was a funny moment when I got to be an adult after, like you're saying, like a long childhood and adolescence of like, oh, you keep this stuff a little bit secret. Like you don't yeah. just go share this. You don't go share this was just anybody. And then it got to a certain point where I think I was an adult and someone was like, oh, are you into that nerd shit? And I was like, <laughs> how, it was like, how long do the top box office hits be like Star Wars, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings? Like, I'm pretty sure this shit is wildly popular. Like who's, who is not into this anymore? Um, do you remember that switch over or did it kind of like for me, it kind of crept up a little bit. It did. Yeah. It totally crept up. Like, I, I mean, when I was really, when I was really young, my sisters and I were really into Dune. I yes. mean, we loved, that's why the fact that it's coming back. I mean, I was like, oh, <laughs> so exciting. Love you. Um, I used to get the whole, oh, 
you were in costume today. It wasn't Halloween like six months ago. Uh, or I remember in my gym locker, I had like a picture of Storm because it's, it's Storm. I mean, a picture of Storm belongs in my locker. When I was maybe like 16 or people were like, really? Like, what are you doing? And I was like, I was like, put it, I took, put it away, put it in the locker. Just I didn't want people to judge me for like what I liked. In 2010, I like grew up on the East Coast, like Connecticut. So I mean, to me, Comic Cons are all over here, and you guys lived in a different. Where we did you grow up here in California? I'm actually a New Yorker, so I was on the East Coast as well. I but oh my but God. Yeah. <laughs> New Yorkers, I love the. I mean, East Coast is another animal. New York is another animal. It's a, I call New York like the East Coast beast, and then LA is like the West Coast beast. So they're just different worlds. But I lived in both before. Um, I got the opportunity to go, actually go to San Diego Comic Con. And I was like, I'm actually going to be there. And this was 2009, I think. 2009, yeah. So it was long, 2009. Yeah. I said to myself, if I'm going to go, I'm going to bring Storm. I'm going to do it. So I went all out. I actually have a friend who makes Batman costumes. So him and I together, we just sort of went all crazy. I had like reflective cape and all this other stuff. And I remember when I was getting into costume, thinking to myself, like going down the escalator, like breathing. But the way it was received by people and people like X-Men fans and Comic-Con, like SCCC goers, it was so amazing and so wonderful that I was, after that, unstoppable. Like, I was like, oh, forget it. I'm doing everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I literally, I, I go to, I mean, I go to, what, 10 conventions a year? <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I love that because that this is an area of the not only like the D&D world, because now we have these like D&D actual play shows where you see a huge amount of cosplay for D&D characters. But cosplay has been a huge part of the convention scene for since I was even a kid. And I've always found it amazing because it's this almost like incredible act of generosity where these are other convention goers who are often the biggest draw of the convention. Like to go and see people engaged in this pageantry with like, oh my God, I saw Batman and Optimus Prime and Wonder Woman. And I saw <laughs> there were a bunch of Ewoks or whatever, you know, you see this stuff. And it's like, this is not the convention putting this up. This is your fellow convention goers. Um, uh, what was getting into that? Um, what was getting into that scene and that community like? And did that eventually lead you to tabletop? Yes, actually, that's a very good question. Um, as soon as I started taking my costuming more seriously, like I was like, oh well, people are people. Cos cosplay wants you to take it there. Like if you like being extra, be a cosplayer because people are gonna really appreciate it. They're like, oh yeah, girl. You got that big drag queen wig on you. Do it, guy. I mean, people, the, the you know the the gender bends, the cross People love creativity in cosplay. It's celebrated. It's encouraged. It's it literally it's it's creative freedom, and I absolutely enjoy it. In cosplay, especially here in LA, where it's just massive, you uh, the a lot of the communities, like you said, cross over. Mm -hmm. So you have people who are like, like I, I do a lot of video game cosplays because I absolutely love video games as well. So in that, I would meet people who did LARP and yes. who went to Ren fairs. And so we'd meet up and I would do, I would go to their, those conventions and I would go to Comic-Con and to the same, we do the same people because nerds are going to nerd, geeks are going to geek. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a ton of crossover and I would see people. Now for me, I actually met, I met Matt Mercer in 2010 Mm -hmm. On the 10, 11, on the set of a, like a Street Fighter music video by Jace Hall. And did you see it? <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Legendary, of course. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, I met Satine, I think, a couple of years later. Um, Eric, I met a couple of those years. So I've, I've, I met a lot of people who are actually in the TTRPG community. I knew Dungeons & Dragons from youth. I just yes. didn't have, I fell in that sort of area where I didn't have anyone who played. So I just would just follow the game. I and mean, some people got lucky and had lots of friends who knew the game and would play with them. But if you have no one to play with, and if you're like kind of semi-socially awkward like me, 
you you have a harder time saying, hey, can I like jump in? You don't know me, but can I jump in your game? I'm already kind of a weirdo, but never mind. I'll step back over here. Oh, like, no. it, you know, you kind of it's it's like in 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 the community itself, there are a lot of people who are are like um, uh, socially awkward, neurodivergent, et cetera. But then you have other people who are even afraid to even to approach that. Like I find myself getting nervous sometimes saying like, can I play? Can I jump in? Whatever. Um, I have come in with a different set of limitations or what I like self-imposed limitations. I'm deaf. Yeah. So, you know, I would, I would kind of watch people play and you, you, as a person who has a, a disability or is differently abled, you are, you know, things that you can and cannot do and you accept that and you say, okay, but there are these things that I know I can do and I can do well. I used to just watch games on YouTube. I knew people played in person, but I was I wasn't there. But I would see games being played on YouTube. I saw um, a bunch of games on YouTube, a bunch of Critical Role stuff, a bunch of Monsters and Fable stuff, Dams and Dice. I saw. In my mind, I'd be like, "Wow, that's really great." But I know that even as a crazy lip reader that I am, I don't think I can. I would be able to to be in those games because just keeping up with people's lips. I mean, when everybody's talking over, but I was like, this is just not going to be something I can do. I think I'd have to be with a group that was either hard of hearing deaf or a group that knew ASL. And that way it would be kind of inclusive that way. But I think, I mean, now when I play and I see all the resources that are available to people who are differently abled, I realized I was putting more limitations on myself than I, than I, I, I should ever could have. Last year, I got, um, I did get a cochlear implant in my right ear. Wow. And then that sort of, I mean, I don't, I don't even, I don't even, even want to say sort of, that completely changed the way I move in hearing spaces. I'm still deaf, but the, the technology that's in my head turned me into a cyborg and I am bionic and it allows me to do things like this interview or sit at a table that is full of people who are hearing. So it's just been, it's just been really different, but interesting, but crazy, but cool. And I'm excited. <laughs> oh, wow, 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 wow. Well, I think what you're, what you were saying is so real, which is that Dungeons and Dragons has a tremendous amount of hurdles in terms of accessibility before even getting to uh, uh, accessibility and inclusivity in terms of disability, like you were saying, like to to broach those social mores of like, can I ask someone to join their game? Will that game be available to me as a deaf or hard of hearing person? Should I get invited to it? Do I feel comfortable asking for this? And then like you're saying, you can even be in like, for lack of a better term, a like tabletop desert. It's like, oh, just I'm living in a place or I've moved to a new city. I don't have a community around of people that I like feel comfortable asking. Um, uh, you know, in terms of nerdy hobbies, D&D mm -hmm. has some very serious, and I think tabletop in general has some serious hurdles in terms of like, yeah. you've got to have some kind of planets aligning in order for this to all work out. Um, uh, so looking at that, which I think is something where it's like uh, uh, those resources are thankfully more available today than they were I remember when I was a kid, but th there's still so much work to be done on making the game more and more inclusive, uh, both for disability reasons and then also, again, for the, just those things of getting mm -hmm three to six people that all vibe with each other. And, yeah. and again, the rules can be crunchy. So like, even if you, I've, I've, there's a lot of people I think who are like, hey, I have people who are down, but nobody feels like biting the bullet to become the dungeon master. Like no one feels <laughs> like, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole other hurdle on top of that. So it can be, accessibility is a very real element. Um, uh, wh where were you when that, that like, first g game opened up? Because it sounds like you had been in these nerd spaces for a while, both doing cosplay and being involved, again, with how many of these circles overlap within the video game world and the voice actor world, specifically as an element of the video game world. Um, where was like your first table? What was your first, what was your first tabletop experience? Oh, that's gonna really kill you. Like I, now I, I told you how, that I've known Matt Mercer for years. I've known Satine for years. These are people who tried to tell me, you can play. <laughs> TJ Storm, TJ Storm, you can play. 
And mm-hmm. I was like, no, no, I can't. I, cause you know, I would say, like I said, it was self-imposed. I'd be like, no, I can't. But it was really because I don't want to be a bother. I don't want to like, like, I don't want to like hold the game up. I don't want to. So you, you do a lot of it, you do to yourself and you know that. I think just in, in all areas of life, we do it. We are our own worst enemies. When you have people coming to you saying, we'll help you play. And you're like, no, I can't. I mean, regard. Regardless of hearing, even feeling, you have to get over that part. But then the, am I comfortable, like, just showing my emotions and being vulnerable and playing a character? What if I suck? So there's a bunch of things that I sort of, you know, I was like, I'll, I'll just stay over here in my costumes. Think I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Well, oftentimes the universe is like, obviously you're not going to do anything. So I'm going to have to prod you Sparta style. <laughs> Bunch of plans to do things. Boom. A pandemic, a global pandemic hit. I'm, imme- I mean, like a lot of people, immediately depressed because conventions and connecting with people, like that's how I get, you know, I pull, I draw energy from other people. So even though like I'm, I'm sort of like, okay, I want to be at home. I also need those events where I get to connect with people who are like me and like, like kind of things that are kind of odd or cool or don't really like fit what people think I should like, you know? Mm-hmm. So things go down like dominoes, events that I'd planned to be in this year, things that I was excited about going to. I told you I have like mannequins standing behind me and different uh, versions of undress, which I'm glad they're covered because I got banned from Mixer for that, but I don't want to talk about that. What? <laughs> the man- what? It makes it was like naked mannequins. I don't think so sweet. I got banned. <gasps> From the <laughs> mannequins? What are they preserving the decency of these artificial statues? What's happening? <laughs> I, I, was a, I, okay, I was like, yeah. y'all do you though. You do you. You do you. They're, they're not real. They don't have a head. They don't have arms or legs, but you do you. Anyway. <laughs> it was, in March, there was a charity game, a big charity game that was going to happen. It was like the beginning of March. TJ Storm, who's I've I've been I've taken his fight classes before for like mocap and stuff like that because I've I've done facial mocap but I want to get into like body I would yeah. love to be like a, you know in it sort of fighter thing but I've done facial stuff like for the Predator game and other stuff like that but anyway mm-hmm. he wrote to me once and said so have you started playing D and D yet and I was like I have the books but no and he's like yeah you're gonna play in this charity game I was like no. He's like, yeah, you're going to play. He's like, you're going to learn, you're going to play. He literally said, you're going to do it. And he's like, when can we do a Zoom meeting this week? And I was like, I guess Friday. And he's like, fine. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, I remember being so nervous. And I'm like, Alicia, you know, you actually know fundamentals of the game. You know these, you know TJ. You're not afraid to be like on camera, really. I'm not afraid of it. I wasn't really born with the embarrassment gene, so I don't know how to embarrass my... Like, I'll be out there, like, making a fool of myself. So <laughs> so he, we, we, we did the meeting, and he was like, I'm going to tell you to learn the easiest martial class for now. We're going to work on building you a barbarian who's level 10. And this is the character you're going to play in the game in a month. And I was like, oh, God. I... <laughs> And the thing is, I do a lot of things, but for some reason, this, I picked so much over it. I picked so much. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's, 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 there's something so, so wild about this, because there's all these worlds that are tangentially created. And I think for people that maybe aren't involved in as many of them, they could go like, well, well, if you're, if you are brave enough to, again, like, hit the convention, dressed as Storm, reflective cape, people all like he- turning heads, like, oh my God, look at that costume. What would make X activity scary? But of course, as people that are like multi di- multidisciplinary, like I've, I did improv for years and years and years and still the thought of doing, yes, oh goodness. That's how I like, I went from D&D into LARPing and then into UCB doing comedic improv and then came full circle back to doing actual play D&D because I got hired by College Humor right at the time oh that they were- so it's this weird thing where I know my mom, as I said, but I, like my mom said when I was a kid and I was playing D&D, she was like, sweetheart, you know, like these skills are going to be really great for whatever it is you end up doing professionally. Lo and behold, no translation of skills necessary. It's exactly the same skills. I'm doing D&D. But it's this funny thing where I took a circuitous route of going into the improv world be- and 
when I first started doing improv, I used to tell people would be like, oh, like, did you do improv as a kid? And I was like, well, mostly I LARPed and I'm kind of doing that on stage still. Like you're all doing improv, I'm LARPing. But uh, point being that there are all these these disciplines that might make you comfortable in one setting that that people sometimes don't understand. No, I still have nerves about doing this related thing. Like it's not exactly the same thing. And I, like yeah. for me, for me, that was often like stand up where it's like, you know, people would be like, do you want to go do stand up? And I was like, stand up. Oh, my goodness. Like they're like, you go on stage and do comedy with nothing prepared. And I'm like, yeah, that's easy. <laughs> Going up with prepared material, people know that I spent time on this. No way! Like, uh, and it's not—it's not always easy oh to God. for people to like intuit where those nerves might come from. Um, when you so you you make this character for for your first game with TJ, this tenth level barbarian. By the way, I will say as a DM, starting with a tenth level character, whoo! There's a lot of powers. There's a lot of stuff to remember for a tenth level character. I, um, I honestly tell people now I'm like because I, I do being like the I call myself like the face of noobetry of RPGs right now like because I literally go in every stream like just so you know I'm the noob so I'm making all the mistakes that you will make but I'm I'm willing to embarrass myself like people will comment like why did she do that that was dumb like and I'm like because I I'm learning <laughs> but I would not advise level 10 first <laughs> 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 Well, that's so, but that's, but here's the funny thing is, so so for Dimension 20, when we had our first season, Allie Beardsley, who's a wonderful member of our, like, our core cast seasons, they played D&D for the first time on camera. They had never played before, and they are they didn't, like, start, you know, they, it was this thing where, like, of course, they'd heard of the game, okay. but they jumped on. Um, and what we found was overwhelmingly, you're right, people loved having a player that was asking the questions about the game that the audience was at home asking. Like, what the hell does that rule mean? Can I get a clarification on what this is? Like, people love having what like you would call an audience surrogate. It's like the Greek chorus. It's that person who's going like, yeah, like bring, bring me the audience member that doesn't know the game yeah. into the story with you. Um, I like uh, that term. I'm going to steal it. Audience surrogate. I like that. Yes. <laughs> it's the person who's like, hey, I'm like you people at home watching. Isn't this stuff wild? Ooh. Like, it's really net. It, we have always said, like, oh, thank goodness we have, like, I think that having a, it's, first of all, it's so fun to play with people who are playing for the first time. I've, like, played, I've introduced so many people to the game, and it's always a joy to bring people in uh, because you oh, really. It's, it's like really we ask the questions. You're right. I'll be like, can I cast shield now or should I hold it? Wait, how does counter spell work? Can I miss these steps as a bonus action? Can I do my bonus action first? Can I use all my movements for this? Like, you just go through the whole gamut. It's great. It's so fun. I mean, in one game, I'm playing with like, um, like four like veteran players. And like, we walked in and we saw like, I mean, a beholder. Okay. Ooh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I, being a new player, was like, Okay, is it, I think we can't. We don't know if it sees us yet. We don't know if it's sleeping. It's just standing over there. Can I use Mage Hand to like, I guess, like open hand, slap it across the face? <laughs> like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> like, okay, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. I want to see if it's awake. <laughs> but that's so good. See, here's the thing, Alicia is like you on Dimension Twenty. That would be the per because the idea of like. We can't be sure if it's awake or asleep. I'll tell you what, if I broadhand magically slap this thing in the face, we'll at least know whether it's awake or asleep. Uh, God, that's so good. That's such a fun move. It's so fun. Um, that's so fun. Um, but that's that's wonderful. So so like go being someone who who again like you're saying you've known Satine for years you've known Mercer for years nerd spaces are like second nature to you at this point but you're coming into the sphere where it's still this new activity um uh, uh was there like a um because one of the interesting things about LARPing, which is my background, is that you're doing a cosplay thing but you're also kind of spending time in character was there um uh, was there any part of like your earlier experiences, either doing like mocap stuff for video games or cosplay that 
like informed your entry into the game. Even something as simple as like, like, uh, were you like, were you like into like, here's what my character's wearing, here's what they look like. Uh, uh, what kind of, of your earlier experiences informed your first playing? And then what were the elements of the game that like on the flip side surprised you or were totally new? Oh, that's a deep question. Actually, it's funny because uh, my sisters and I, two younger sisters, were actually really, really geeky kids. We're some, we were completely different and weird, and we loved being intellectual and reading encyclopedias. We were, we were kind of bizarre kids. Mm -hmm. um, when I look back, some of the stuff that we were doing together, like making cardboard swords, was like an early version of LARP. And we had like the fake British accents that we were like, come to me, the ancient you. You don't talk to me like that. Who do you think you are? Step to me with your sword. Like we had these really bad, we would do all that stuff with each other when we were kids. Cause you know what kids are really sort of open and free and like they, they, they can entertain themselves for hours. So my sisters and I would LARP with each other, LARP with each yes. other all the time. Uh, cosplay was like the next step of that, dressing up as an, and being another character. And that's how I describe the difference between cosplay and Halloween to people who ask. I'm like, Halloween dress up is dress up. Cosplay is you're becoming that character for that photo, for that convention. You're like, you know how people say, oh, I really hate Deadpool cosplayers. The reason why they say that is because they will show up at the event and troll their way through it like Deadpool would. <laughs> <laughs> They become the character. They become the character at the convention. They're like, oh, here comes another Deadpool cosplayer. Here we go. So that's how it is. Um, moving forward into that, uh, I never did. I did. Actually, I did. I did a little bit of improv in high school. Just a little bit, though. Mm -hmm. And I, so, I, so hearing that you come from a UCV background makes me think I'm like that. I didn't think of that connection, but that's definitely there. You're right. It's, a, it's all improv, like just sort of coming up on the fly with stories or behaviors or true life reactions to something that would happen yes. like, in any situation. Yeah. So the game, so then you add the game. I mean, besides the, the math stuff and uh, knowing stats and all that, the, the, I would say the hardest part of it is is being is feeling um, being okay being vulnerable and not sitting there going do I do I feel stupid are people going why are you doing that why are you acting it's being okay with falling into that character personality that you have created for yourself and just being okay be, like being it like not being so like super self conscious and that's actually a bigger even as someone who comes from a slight performance background. Like getting getting past that part. Like, can I can I use this accent and not offend anybody? Can I um am 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 I convincing? Is it okay if I'm kind of emotional? Is it weird? Am I so you know those little self doubt things come up? But that's been the that's been the most interesting part is jumping into the skin of another of another thing and being it. It's sort of like weird. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like, it's so funny because it's a high that I feel like people are chasing through a million different, like, all of these things that we're doing touch on that. Cosplay is a way of getting to there, of being someone. Improv is another way of being someone. All these different pursuits come back to this root human desire to like, for a period of time, I wanna destroy my ego and I wanna be someone else. I wanna talk about this because in your incredible CV of all the cool stuff you've done, neuroscience grad is one of those things. And I want, <laughs> And it's so cool because what's so funny is when I used to teach improv, more I would quote uh, neurologists and neuroscientists way more than I would quote other comedians in terms of real for real because I would say like, look, yes, there's a lot of anecdotal advice that comedians have given about how to do comedy, but one of the things that was always so helpful to me was like, here's what people that that study the brain have to say mm -hmm. about humor and about what the nature of humor is. And I feel like the same can definitely be applied to like tabletop. Um, talk to me a little bit about like what drew you to neuroscience, which, and to me, like, like if there are any connections you feel between your time studying neuroscience and what it is like to kind of professionally be other people and what that, that psychological impulse is in human beings to want to live inside a story and be someone else. 
Yeah, exactly. I actually went to college because I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. So Ooh. I went to school like pre-vet. Well, I came out of out of high school like big, huge, big, huge physics sort of person. I was like, I'm going to be a physics major. I mean, physics was my thing. But then you, when you go to college, what are you, 17 years old? You're like, oh, forget it. You don't know what you're, you know what you're talking about. You're like, I'll be in, I'll be a, um, a, an underwater fudge maker. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> so, I started studying pre-vet and then I did apprenticeships with veterinarians and I realized something. I love animals. I do not really want to cut them open all the time. I had a hard time seeing, like we, you deal with, with the sad parts. I dealt with, you know, animals that were having to be euthanized, to put it, you know, to put down because they were sick and people falling on, you know, adults falling on me because their family member, I'm like, their family member's not going to last, you know? So I was like, I, I, I'm not cut out for this part of being an animal lover. I just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a pet, I'm a pet person. I like pets. I can't give shots. The, the pet's looking at me like it hates me. I want to cry. The cat sees me coming. It starts screaming. I'm like, I can't do this job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in school, I started taking statistics classes because I numbers that run them kind of fast. And I met a professor, and that's usually where it happens, uh, during some summer classes. And he was, I was like, what do you, he's like, I'm, I'm the neuroscience professor at, at, in the School of Neuroscience here at uh, University of Connecticut. And I was like, I'm going to take some of those classes. I started rolling into his, and then I was like, I'm switching my major. Am I actually working in neuroscience now? No, but it was such an amazing background for human behavior. I would not yes. trade it for anything. yes. Unbelievable. I get literally what you said. Like, I mean, we, we, I mostly studied things like Parkinson's uh, and Alzheimer's and the effects on uh, the nucleus accumbens and stuff like that. <laughs> However, the uh, like side classes I had to take did teach me a lot about human behavior, how develops, how we process uh, um, uh, feelings and emotions and what parts of the brain are triggered when you're ha- when you're very happy and when you're sad. And I learned um, you brought this up, which is so super interesting. I learned how positivity is something that you humans have to actually work for. So in this time when everybody's like slowly spiraling into versions of depression, you have to actively seek out ways of making yourself feel good. If that means playing some home games, which I'm in like three now, playing some stream games, uh, you know, finding things to keep yourself happy because we as human beings are hardwired for negativity. And I'll tell you why. This is actually a neuroscience thing. Um, If you think about like our ancestors who were like what, out in the woods or whatever, and they could step out their front door and get attacked by a saber tooth tiger tomorrow. Or they could walk out the door and just get killed because something flies across the room and hits them and they die. Our brain is actually not as advanced as like we are kind of, so to speak. So like there's a lot of parts of our brain that are really very ancient, you know? Mm -hmm. So if something bad happens and you, so you say it, so then your brain registers to itself, okay, that I did that and that bad thing happens. In order to keep you safe, your mind will say, but also that bad thing can happen. And oh, wait, that bad thing can happen too. Sooner or later, you're in your cave like, I'm never leaving. I'm never doing anything ever again. <laughs> but, but you stay alive though, right? Yeah. You see what I mean? So. Yes. In order to keep negativity from spiraling, and I'm not talking about clinical depression, I'm talking about just in you know negative feelings, you have to like force them out and bring in the things that actually bring you joy. And for me, I um I will say that I mean DND has just been my savior and being able to be a part of it. And then also like you said to bring in my costuming. So I'm bringing in cosplay. I get to, when I do my when I do streams, I try to dress up where I can, so I'm getting that part of the costuming. But then there's that extra layer of not only am I dressing like characters I love, they're my own characters. And then three, I get to be them and speak like them and act like them. And everybody else is doing it too, so I'm not the weird one anymore. It's so cool. Oh, God, I love that. Well, it's, I, first of all, I feel like I could go down any of these paths that we've talked about for like a full hour. But it's the, both the neuroscience stuff, which is so fascinating about, yeah, like how our brains function. Because anytime, to me, the, the parts I love the most about tabletop are the parts where we're exploring what it means to be human, which is always going to relate back to neurology and psychology in meaningful ways because we're trying to understand ourselves and each other, right? Uh, and then the cosplay stuff is so cool, too. I just, what you saying that made me think of this amazing thing where um, 
you know, like back when I was LARPing, that power of costuming was so real to take a bunch of, you know, little, you know, 13 year old LARPers off in the woods at a, in a camp bunkhouse. And suddenly you're looking at an army of warriors arrayed. Look at these tunics and jerkins. Um, but it's really wild. We, I remember this one, this one thing we had that, that I'll sort of never forget in terms of, uh, the ritualistic element of like costume, which I think is behind a lot of cosplay, where I remember one time we ran a modern day game. So it was a game set in modern day where all these little teenage LARPers were gonna be playing teenagers. And we sort of said like, can people just wear their own clothes? I mean, it's not like they're not playing. It was sort of like an urban fantasy, like modern day fantasy where you're just wearing sneakers and jeans and stuff. And what we actually did was we did a camp clothing swap where we said, get your friends together, grab stuff. And yes, you're wearing teenager clothes, but you're actually gonna be wearing your friends clothes. You're gonna be like doing a camper swap. And it was so, so fun. The whole camp got together. We did some swaps. We were like, make sure you keep a tag of where your clothes are going. So your parents don't yell at us at the end of the week when none of you have the clothes that you came with. But one of the reasons we did it is it got people so in character because even though they were just wearing street clothes, which is not in our normal medieval LARP stuff, they it the the aid that is given to people by being in costume to allow them to sink so deeply into character and this feeling of look i'm not myself anymore there was this really powerful component that allowed people to get so deeply into character that game even wearing completely modern day clothing and stuff like that um i totally see how that it's it's you're right it actually it's to, it's really powerful and there are people who will say well how come you have a problem being yourself and i was like there's something to be said for people who are not scared to show other figments of their other parts of their personality and people who aren't afraid to try to see what it would be like to be someone else yeah i think that's a skill i don't think it's a negative at all i'm like i i, I think stepping into someone else's skin convincingly, that's a skill. Like when I watch the people like you, Matt, people who are really good at what they do, to me it's like, it's 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 amazing because you're realizing this really isn't scripted. They're actually becoming, I find it, I, I think I just, I've always thought it was just amazing. Oh, well, thank you very much. I super appreciate it. It's very, very kind to say, but it's true. I think the, the, the real thing there too is, I'll be honest, I think that there is a maybe a correlation between the people I know who spend a lot of time being other people and them <laughs> having a healthy sense of self. You know what I mean? It's almost <laughs> like it provides you some perspective on who you are if you spend a little bit of time being somebody else every once in a while. Um, That's right, you do. You, it, it gives you an opportunity to really examine a lot of parts of your personality because you're allowing yourself to be super vulnerable. So you become, I've learned that it, it's just, it sounds really weird, but I, I've, I've gotten in touch with a lot of different uh, feelings that I've had over over things just by playing D&D. &D. And I know that sounds really weird to people who don't play, but people who do play would be like, oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, really, really do get into it. So No, it's so it's, true. I mean, I remember being there. There are so it's it's not um, how do I put this? It's really tangible for me, looking back over the characters that I've played in games that I got a chance to play for a long time, to look at really concrete lessons I've played. I've played, I remember a couple of campaigns in my youth where I played like evil aligned characters. Um, and I remember playing them and I'm, th that usually had some sort of like sad humanizing thing, but they were reacting to it from a place of hurt and cruelty and yada yada. And a lot of those characters came to very bad ends and were very miserable. And you watched as their coping mechanism, for lack of a better word, that came from this place of like, I played like a neutral evil elven mercenary who was cruel and, and like embittered by war. And I played this lawful evil giant barbarian who wanted to like, <laughs> you wanted to like crush the enemies of whatever. And as you play them over multiple sessions, you go like, oh, this like deeply rage filled hurt person that I'm playing is, is uh, gonna keep digging themselves deeper into this hole. And I think there's a like, I can completely look back on those characters and be like, 
uh, I made an effort to be like nicer and more empathetic in my real life because I felt like I had firsthand experience of like, hey, that doesn't work. Like we, I've I've played out a story. That's right. Like it doesn't work. This strategy is bad, and you get experience being like. What is me, but a little bit kinder and more heroic? What is me, but a little bit more selfish and cunning? What is me, but a little bit braver and bolder and more reckless? That's and, right. You know, like you, 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 these experiments aren't afforded to us in day-to-day -day life. And I think there's so much value in just expl exploring facets of yourself through play. Um, right, because you're sort of like, for you, you might you might have been working something out. By, yeah. by playing that character, there's certain things you that there's certain things like in your um, subconscious mind that you just needed to get out and work through. Oh, that's such a good perspective. I didn't think of that. I'm writing that down too. <laughs> I'm stealing a bunch of things from this interview. <laughs> Hell yeah, I love it. Uh, this is why we this is why we have the academy. We're here. We're all. It's like it's a very cool uh, new medium from the last like couple decades, and it's so awesome to be able to talk to you about it because I feel like uh, there is it's so special and there's so much to be shared. Um, uh, One thing for me I wanted to say is that um, since I started playing, I've and because I literally start every game with "I'm new," <laughs> I get a lot of messages from people who want to play. So many people, like it's it's literally my inboxes on every social platform I'm on are full of people saying they want to play, and. The number one thing is, yes, get the player handbook, you know, join D&D &D Beyond, watch a lot of streams on YouTube. That's how you familiarize yourself with the game and stuff. You do need the books, whether they're digital or, or um, hard copies. But the only way to learn is to find groups. And I know a lot of people have been going on Reddit to find groups or going on Facebook, whatever, to find groups. I think something you said earlier in this conversation is really important is the chemistry of the group. So if you join a group and you're like, oh, wow, that was terrible. I'm never playing again. The next group you play with could be like completely different. And you're like, oh my gosh, I found my home. So it is, yes. I mean, it, it's just a lot of variables that go into the, the full experience. So it's the DM, it's the players, it's the, the storyline, it's what your character is in that thing. So it's, you keep trying to find the right permutations of things until it clicks and you're like, I love this character. It's my main. Yes. It's like a hundred percent. And I think too, that like, I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying about like, um, D and D is a lot of things, but one of the things it is not is passive. It is active media. It is not something, there are a lot of wonderful things in the world that you can just sit back and enjoy. D and D requires a lot of active participation. And as a result of that, I would say for as amazing as the structures of the system are and the incredible content that goes into it, the game is centered around what you and your pals are bringing to it. There's just no getting around that, right? Like, uh, like you know, you and the people that you love and respect as storytellers and as performers are, of course, going to bring so much to the table because it really is a thing that, like, you, if you take two different groups of people playing the exact same module, you're going to have two totally different stories. Uh, there it is, you know, not to get all cheesy about it, but, like, <laughs> Every person is a little beautiful, unique snowflake. You, you, you are going to give a contribution that nobody else on earth could give. Um, so I do totally agree that that chemistry is very significant. I would almost say again to people like, yes, go find groups online. There's Reddit, there's Discord servers for gamers all over. There's tons of people. But I would also say that a certain part of me would give advice like if you and if you have a group of friends that you really gel with and none of you feel super able to like play DD, &D, i would say like go with the group of friends like go with your group of friends that you are super gelled with and give it a shot stumble through it it, it might be a mess <laughs> but like so what it's a mess a mess with your best friends sounds like a good time that sounds like a goddamn hoot um <laughs> yeah it's a mess, but it's our mess. Oh, it's exactly. It's our beautiful mess. You know, I mean, like, Critical Role didn't become Critical Role right out of the gate. They were friends playing. I mean, they all played before, but they were friends playing for years. And then this grew into this big, amazing thing. So, I mean, I, I, I love the idea of just sort of starting fresh as a group and just seeing, like, where it goes and asking all the weird questions, doing all the stupid stuff and just learning as you go. It's like, this is the safe place to do it in, man. Oh, Roll course. with it. 
Of course. What's the thing is, I think the the I the the, the I feel lucky for having started at an age where truly I was three years into playing when me and my brother and our friends looked around and were like, oh, we've been getting one of the central rules of the game fully wrong, like badly wrong for three years. And we were like, <laughs> We were like, our misinterpretation of this rule made the game virtually unplayable, but we were having a ball. We were having such a good time. Like, we didn't know. So I think that there's this, you have to divorce yourself from this adult perspective of a fear of doing it wrong. Because the game, the game is so complicated. Look, I've been playing since I was 10 years old. I get stuff wrong constantly. The game is really? complex. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay, I need to hear this because let me tell you, I'll be in here and I'll be like, wow, I have no spells prepared for that. So can I throw my shoe and how much damage will it do? Can I use catapult? Like I literally was in a game and I was like, I did not prepare any offensive spells. I have catapult though and I have three spell slots or whatever. Can I take my shoe up and throw? I only have two shoes. I'm screwed. Oh, no. So everybody on stream is like, did she just pull a Shankla spell? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> exactly, it's great. Well, what I, my advice too would be like, if you're in a situation where a player is like, listen, I didn't have the spells prepared for this. Can I take my <laughs> shoe off? I feel like as a DM in in my position, like I would look at that and be like, okay, like Alicia's gonna throw a shoe, but she has a spell caster. Why can't this shoe just do magic missile damage? Like, is there any, is it gonna break the game to just have the sort? No, it's not gonna break the game. I would totally rule like you huck your shoe, it unerringly hits, it explodes in magical energy, 3d4 plus three damage, everyone's having a ball. Did that sorcerer just throw a magic shoe at me? I think so. Um, <laughs> it worked. It did some damage, man. I lost my shoes today. So I had like, I don't know, I, I get I mean, like plus one on stealth or something. I don't know, whatever. But yeah, I did some damage with those shoes. Or... That sounds like a really great rules compromise to be like, I'm going to let this do spell damage, but it's going to be all difficult terrain for the rest of the day because your shoe blew up <laughs> and now you're walking around down a shoe. <laughs> it's funny um, because... um. Oftentimes, when the when the worst things happen in the game, they're the most memorable and funny. And you you can act, like we my friends and I will like literally recall these moments weeks later. Like I remember once we were in in an instant where there were a bunch of like kobolds, and my friends and I were standing outside the door. And we're like, we can go in there. We know there are like six kobolds in there, and there are two big ones and four small ones. Like, what are we gonna do? Like, we were fully in the role play. And then one guy we have was like, okay, this is what we're gonna do. You have a uh, uh, thought life. You can change yourself into a dragonborn. And I was like, yeah, but I don't understand the language. So, but the other girl did. So she did like this quick thing where she taught me how to say the language. Now, so we had this whole plan on how to do this. I was gonna walk in as a dragonborn because kobolds, I guess, look up to dragonborn. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. But apparently they do. They're like, if you walk in a dragonborn, they're gonna go, oh. And since I could change myself, I, I was the one to do it, but I didn't speak the right language. So I, the DM was like, you guys can try, roll for it. Because I rolled a natural one <laughs> with no way to save it. Instead of walking in and saying something really powerful, like either stop what you're doing now or all of you will perish. I said something like, you all smell like goats. <laughs> it was something weird. It was something like that. And they all like dropped what they were doing and attacked us all. And I was like, Chef's oh. kiss. Chef's kiss. Oh no! <laughs> I Everything can't. fell apart. <laughs> In my head, I'm just like, oh, the potential to pull like a Cyrano de Bergerac where you're fully disguised as a dragonborn and the other character is just like message can tripping and you're like stumbling through the pronunciation of a language you can't speak. God, that sounds so funny. But that's the thing. It's like those big swings like make the game so fun, whether they work or not most of the time. It's like, God, those huge swings, those big moments. It's just so enticing. We have, we've been, uh, uh, 45 minutes has flown by. Um, uh, uh, we got a- Oh my uh, gosh. <laughs> Having a ball. Um, we have a bunch of awesome uh, audience uh, audience questions. Uh, these are submitted on our Discord. Thanks Discord users for submitting these uh, great, great questions. Um, uh, uh, so uh, we'll jump right in here. Um, uh, this first one comes to us from Sassy Sea Slug. Thanks, Sassy Sea Slug. Yay! Yay! 
right? Um, uh, which is, uh, the question is, which source material do y'all think has the coolest aesthetic? Well, this is a fun question. If there's like a particular book uh, in general, which has like a very cool aesthetic or vibe. I feel like I'm a big fan of so much of stuff. And I think both in D&D and like other tabletops as well, there's a bunch, bunch of cool stuff. Do you remember being like particularly drawn to like the vibe or aesthetic of like an early D&D product or like uh, uh, some kind of like handbook uh, as you first started playing? <laughs> Um, for me, you know, for me, honestly, it is, it, it, it's, it's just the PHB. It, I mean, yeah. I, that's what I usually follow. I mean, I have been, I've, I'm just now, cause I'm, I'm new as of February. I have just been, I've been moving to the, the other books and like the new races now. Um, a couple of the dams I work with per, would prefer we stayed classic. And there are, there are a lot of dams that would just, because they don't know the, the mechanics behind some of the newer characters, like from Aberon and stuff like that. Yeah. So I have been sticking to the classics, but for a, a game I'm getting ready to play in, in November, I do get to roll a tabaxi. tabaxi. Yes, so yes, I'm yes, excited yes. about it. I'm excited about that. Um, other, I have played other systems as well, but so far most of the games I play in now are just PHB classic and taking that stuff and like making it your own sort of. I think a lot of people now in D&D are definitely more open to, you know, sort of changes that still fit the stats. Yes. Like, oh, I'm a vampire hunter, but I have the stats of a, you know what I mean? So and so kind of reskinning stuff, homebrewing a little bit here and there. Um, yeah. I think that's great. And I, I recommend that as well because it's like, do it, those little personalized touches can be the thing that makes you like really fall in love with a character. Uh, and again, the game is, is weird because it's like, uh, uh, those tweaks, if you, as long as you're careful, you can get away with most of those tweaks and it won't imbalance the game, but it will personalize the game, which at the end of the day, the game is about that collaborative storytelling. Um, uh, I love those like expansions that add things like Tabaxi and like Volos is so fun. The new Tasha's is very fun. But I also love because the, the new Tasha's has little like in world quotes. I remember my, my earliest uh, one of my earliest favorite expansions for D&D, this is way back in the day, was the Planescape setting, which was all about adventures in the Outer Plains. So in the Nine Hells, or in the Celestial Plains, or in like the Elemental Plains of Fire and Water and things like that. Oh. Um, it was so cool. So it was all fun. it was all like dimension hopping. It was like, and it was very funny because anyone from the Outer Plains was always, like, if an adventurer showed up from an actual, like, world, it was always like, oh, that person's like a hayseed. Like, that person's, like, yeah. from the boonies. Like, oh, you're from a world? Like, oh, give me a break. This person's, like, they're not cosmopolitan. <laughs> like, I was born in hell. Like, I'm cosmopolitan. I'm from one of these infinite planes of existence. But what I loved about the setting is, and I love when setting does this, setting do this, is, yeah. Like half of the text in that in those old source books um, was like diegetic, like in world text. So like half the stuff was like, here's how you do a character, here's your stats, and the other half was writing from the perspective of characters living in that world. Them in their own character voice, talking about the city they were from, talking about the vibes of it. People like from the different factions being like, here's what you gotta know about working for these guys. Like um, I miss the stuff that, it was very cool because it made you, get into the like for me so much of world building is not about like statistics and logistics it's about vibe like what's the vibe what's the mood what's the tone what's the genre um and i love those source books that like there's so many good indie games out there that do that do a great job as well of like hitting vibe really really well um, I don't see. I like hearing this from from you because I am I am going to bite the bullet and DM at some point. <gasps> yes. Oh, that's oh. I want to be a puppet master. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, it's uh, first of all that's so cool. Whoever your players are, are super lucky. Um, uh, and I will say too. Um, I, my wish for you on your first outing as a DM is to get as much puppet mastering in as possible. Because let me tell you, those strings pull back hard from those players. The puppets, <laughs> the puppets, I a lot, usually in sessions get the strings tangled around me and end up being pulled around by my puppets. So 
<laughs> that's the get ready. Uh, that's the vibe most of the time. Um, oh, God. Uh, oh gosh. I'm just taking notes. I'm watching. I'm doing a YouTube University and all the DM tips and everything because I'm going to start off with one shot with my friends. I'm going to see how it rolls. Hell yes. That's a great way to start off, I feel like. Um, <laughs> uh, do you? Uh, uh, that's so, so fun. Um, uh, speaking of jumping in and DMing for the first time, um, uh, uh, oh, this is uh, this is sort of fun here. Um, this question is from Kat. Thanks, Kat. Um, this, uh, yeah, Kat. Uh, any advice on keeping a voice-only remote session organic and engaging? Dead air is killing my games. Uh, well, you know, me and Alicia have been talking all about this new pandemic world where you know all of our sessions are remote sessions for the most part. Um, I'm trying to think of like good advice for dead for dead air. I I would say don't be too worried about like you're with your pals. Like you, you don't have to feel especially if there's no cameras rolling. You don't have to feel like you have to be on a hundred percent of the time. Um, is it weird that my first thought of advice for this was like have some music playing and also have some snacks out? <laughs> <laughs> snacks. That's what I that's like the whole way. I mean, at least you can grab some pizza while everybody's sitting there thinking about what to do next. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, with, with the whole Zoom thing, um, I think what you were saying is right. It's sort of like, I mean, if you're streaming or you're playing like like you have a time, so like you're in a, you know, D&D celebration and you know the game has to wrap up in two hours. Yeah, there has to be like pacing and the DM is under a lot of pressure to keep you guys moving and to keep the game going so that it ends it right at a time. And I always look at that, I'm like, DMs in like those games must be like insane because they have, I have an hour and a half to get you guys from here to here and then for it to wrap up. How am I gonna do this? Yeah. If you're playing Zoom with friends, I do think it, um, not to, I think some of it might be sort of like the DM anxiety. Like uh, if everybody, if there's dead air, is everybody having fun? They usually are. They're just might be looking at their spell books or trying to figure out what to do. If it's a home game, I try to, I have a friend who's DMing now who's sort of new and he gets, he's like, did everyone have fun? I was like, you couldn't tell we were having a ball. He's like, I couldn't tell you were having a ball. I'm like, we all had a ball. Trust me. It's, yes. so it's part of this, like the anxiety that just comes from being a DM. Yeah. No, I think that's a great, like piggybacking off that point, I think that that is really true because D&D fun is a different kind of fun than other kinds of fun. Like if you're running a D&D &D session and your expectation is that whenever your players aren't narrating their action, they're in the background going, woo, yeah! Like you gotta lower, <laughs> this is amazing. Like you're playing for three hours. Like that level of energy is impossible to sustain. Don't, don't put that pressure on yourself. Um, <laughs> impossible, impossible. Um, uh, D and D fun can look like different things. Like sometimes a session gets moody or grim and people are very like stone faced because that's the mood of the campaign that they're in. Um, sometimes, people are in like intense problem solving modes. Like I ran this game that was a bunch of gnomes in this magical gnomish metropolis doing a heist in a world where like, instead of technology, it was all powerful magic and magical items. So they were doing the equivalent of like an Ocean's Eleven bank vault heist, but in this magical palace protected by elementals and contingency spells, magical alarms, summoned animals, figuring out how do we like not trip the summoning spell when we like spider climb across the roof because these magical yes, arms spider climb. Arms. Spider climb, oh, so cool. Uh, <laughs> these spells are just so cool. Um, within that, there was an entire, we were playing over a weekend. There was a six hour session in the, in, on like the second morning. Nobody talked because everyone was just deep in these like third party source books looking yeah. for like researching spells and no one was smiling. People were having a blast because, because I was playing with a party that loved that amount of nerdery and mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and like, that's the thing. Engagement doesn't always look like, woo, right? Um, exactly right. That's exactly true. That's it. <laughs> uh, exactly. Um, uh, but that being said, I think like, uh, uh, weirdly, I think, yeah, like, like if you're, if you're having a problem with the dead air, having a little soundtrack under your game to keep the mood up. Um, and I'll also say like, some of this is on your players as well. Like, um, uh, you know, like, 
your GM is not like a hired entertainer. Like, if <laughs> you know, like that's not what that is. Like, you can have interactions at the table with like if I see that, that like my dungeon master is looking something up or like figuring out a rule adjudication, I will use that moment as a player to turn to another player and be like, so what do you think about this next event? Like, do a scene. Yeah. Like, you're also playing. <laughs> Yeah. That's my little my little rant on on player responsibility to also have the game keep moving forward. I agree. Um, hell yes. Um, uh, oh, this is this is so fun. Um, <laughs> uh, this next question comes to us from QR. Um, uh, what is the difference between TTRPG uh, and LARP? And I'll also append cosplay in here as well. These are like our childhood pursuits. What does that visceral element of LARPing add to the storytelling? Does theater of the mind encourage you to go bigger and wilder in play? Love the program. Thanks, QR. Um, oh, thank you, QR. That's a good question. A very good question. Yeah, like as, as someone who has spent so much time in the sort of make-believe world, existing in it very viscerally, costume, physicality, kind of whole body acting. Mm -hmm. um, was there a weird transition to this thing where it's like, I'm gonna be fully in character from the <laughs> waist up <laughs> and like, and otherwise I'm just kind of sitting down. Um, what was- <laughs> Ears on, makeup, you know, full like the tiara on, just full makeup and whatever, but you're not doing anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Really cool. Is there like, is there, yeah, is there temptation to be like, okay, I have the full Wonder Woman get up and then just like a pair of jeans because it's just the webcam. Like, no, what, like, why would I go to all the extra mile to put these boots on? Um, uh, uh, yeah, like, what was the, uh, um, what was the transition like for you from being someone who was like fully embodying characters at conventions to then go into this thing where I think it, it is a little bit trippy and, and unintuitive at first to like, like, what was your first experience when you realized you needed to not only speak in character, but then also jump out of your character to third person, like narrate what they're doing? Oh, it's for uh, last like a better. It's a mind f for me <laughs> <laughs> because when you're cosplaying, the biggest concern really is: is my costume going to stay on my body and not fall apart as you're walking around the convention? And are the pictures going to look convincing? Like, is everything going to be this or this or this? Like, is everything going to look convincing when the pictures, when I take the pictures? When you are in playing D and D, and then you're in a costume, and then you're like basically acting as it, it's actually kind of. At first, for me, it was disconcerting. Now, I absolutely love it because I really get an opportunity to just like, like it's really sort of um, it's just it's, it's meaty. I, I feel like there's there's so much more depth to the character when I get to become and speak like it because we don't get to do that in a cosplay really. Like you're not, you know, we don't really speak as, we more act as, we move as. Whereas LARP is like all of that. It's speaking, moving, dressing like, acting like, personality. Like, I mean, in real life, would you ever spin the floor and say, you stupid boy, step forward now. And it's, but, you, but when you when you get over yourself, like don't think, oh, I don't want to be stupid. When you get past the self-conscious part, you will have fun, so much fun. And then you re when you finally realize that as much as you think people are thinking about what you're doing or talking about you, they're not. They're just, they're really thinking about what they're, what they're themselves are doing. So this is like your opportunity to literally try anything. I mean, well within the constraints of not hurting yourself or hurting someone else, like in LARP especially, that's really important because I've had yes. friends really get hurt in LARP by someone acting crazy. It's like chaotic evil is not fun in LARP. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is like, like I was saying earlier and uh, Brennan was saying, this is a safe place for you to just try, uh, try it out, see what happens. You might really like it. Yes. Oh, I love that so, so, so much. There's so much that I think that like within that conversation about moving into those characters, and I really love like, Alicia, you've said a couple times now this thing of like, don't be afraid to be silly. And what I want to underline for people is that is like always a choice. It actually relates also back to what you were saying about um, uh, like f you have to be conscious about choosing positivity. That 
encroaching self-judgment and self-doubt is omnipresent. And I want to say it is okay to feel those ghosts and whispers of self-doubt. You just have to push them to the side. I will say, I've been, again, I've been playing this game for like, you know, my entire adult life since I was 10 years old, I've been playing this game. Every time you sit down to start a session, mm -hmm. I, like no one could be more comfortable with this game than me. Every time you sit down, there's a little bit of like, okay, me and my sober adult friends are gonna play pretend now. It's a little silly. It's a little bit yeah. silly. <laughs> And you have to make the conscious choice to push through that. I think anyone who's ever seen me start a Dimension 20 campaign, look, yeah. when I start those campaigns, I'm like a, I'm like even more high octane energy than normal. That's because I know that I can help set the tone by being as you know berserk and high energy and deep in character as possible. If I do that, I'm helping my players overcome that initial self-critical, like, hey, you're an adult, don't be silly voice. Like, you have to be the- So right. That makes so much sense. Like, if the DM comes in, like, three wing, three ring circus or whatever, yeah. you're gonna be like, well, pfft, damn, I'll be a sideshow, no problem, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. But that's the thing. Thank you. But I thought, well, whew. okay, good. We got a good piece of good. Every time we do one of these episodes, I'm like, did I, I hope I said something that someone could use. Um, uh, but I think it's really true because you, there is that little, I think as a GM, again, you're not, I, I disagree. I think GMs are not like the boss of the table. You are amongst peers. We're all collaborating telling a story. But because the GM is setting the scene, you are a little bit of a maestro in terms of like getting us all in the same key. Like what's the tone I'm gonna, I want us all to harmonize. So like, what's the, what are we, what's gonna be the tone as we set it up here? And especially if you're playing with players that could be a little bit shy or people that don't have a performance background. And so are like, hey, I, I'm not gonna just like leap into a character voice. Like you're talking about playing with your sisters and just jumping into silly voices. Like often when I'm playing with a group of shy players, I will have an NPC show up with a wild voice that is very gregarious because it will help snap people into something. Like, yeah. you know, like if I if I look at a group of players that are a little bit shy, I know that if I come in and I play a character who's like very kind of snide and judgmental, even unbeknownst to me, that character might put someone in their head <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> Like, as opposed to playing characters like, hey there, friend, good to meet you. Hey, what's your name? What are you doing here? Like, <laughs> that will just like break someone out of their shell just through raw force of energy. Um, and I think that that's a good piece of advice for, for all GMs to think about setting up your scene such that your character has an emotion to feel in their very first scene. For example, we did a thing one time where I was playing with characters that I knew were playing for their very first time and knew didn't have a performance background. And so I was like, high probability that this player is gonna have a strong self-doubt voice. Um, and rather than just starting them out and being like, you're in a tavern, what do you do? Which for a shy player could be like anxiety inducing of like, uh, uh, I, <laughs> I, I get a drink? God, I don't know. Like, I started them out in a scene where they were about to go off on their adventure. They were a little halfling adventurer. And their little halfling mother was going like, be careful out there in the wide world. I don't think you should go. Could you stay? You shouldn't have to go on an adventure. It's a scary world out there. Because when you have that big emotional thing, it it tricks people. It doesn't trick, but it puts people in that position where they sort of naturally go like, Mom, it's okay. I'm gonna be all right. I know, like when you give someone something to kind of dance with and energy to dance with, they they assume that role more easily. Um, yeah, right, exactly. That's easy. And um, one thing I wanted to definitely raise, um, I watched a, a panel during celebration this this past weekend, and it was it was a whole I guess table of people who main bards. Yes. And me, I've. I actually don't see myself ever doing a bard because I don't sing. And I, I, for some reason, I feel like people, when they have a bard at the table, they expect the bard to sing or play a musical instrument. And I'm like, I feel like they'd be like, bard, sing us into battle. And I'd be like, can I, can, I can moonwalk or dance for you? Can I do the robot? <laughs> like, I, I, mean, I can't sing. So I just stay away from the bard. 
But a couple of things that they that that one of the people on the panel brought up that really stuck with me was, you know, this is your character. You if you don't feel like being extra and there's extra people at the table, that's okay. Their character can be the extra one, and your character can be the one that's more reserved, and that's okay, too. Um, I think me and Brennan, like, our point is just, if you are afraid, like, you want to be a certain way, but you're afraid to, don't be afraid to try that. But if, if your character is more of the laid back, like, sort of, like laying back like the pilot and it's like, I just want to sit here with my ale. Then that's fine. You don't have to be tap dancing like the freaking bard at the table, like a lute or something like that. A hundred percent. No, that's extremely well put. And that they, that people shouldn't feel that pressure. And there are performances, like even for me, as a generally sort of, you know, extroverted, gregarious person, <laughs> to, to say it sort of lightly, the, the uh, uh, I remember playing like like sort of like, stoic, dour, quiet characters. And that can be really rewarding too, to have that character that really is like the the grim man of few words archetype. Um, the whole point is, that I love is like exploring that spectrum or range of different human behaviors, uh, or in that case, giant behaviors. But um, it's very, very fun and engrossing. And I think what you're saying, yeah, there there is no one right way to do it. Um, Speaking of bards, first of all, that 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 was an awesome panel. People should go check out. That was Omega Jones about <laughs> that panel. That's a good friend, panel. friend of the friend of the pod. Um, uh, uh, speaking of bards specifically, because I would love to talk about this because it does feel in a fun way, kind of like a personality thing. Yes. As you're, especially for someone, especially for someone who is like jumping, like you know, deep into the D and D world within their first year of like really being in the game. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, for, we have an audience question, um, which is uh, from T full 76. And there's a little emoji of a frog. How'd they get that next to their name? Cool. Um, uh, <laughs> what do you believe to be the best subclass for each class gameplay wise, or what you like most sort of like, I guess like favorite subclass. I'll also just open it up to you. Like, what is your favorite class? You're in your, first year of being deep in the game what do you what are you drawn to class wise you know it's funny like i went into the game because i'm, I'm such a big fan of she hulk and superheroes and then all the badass females in video games like sonya blade and mortal kombat and stuff like that um I, so i went into dnd thinking i'm probably going to end up being a martial class i'm going to be a barbarian i'm going to be a paladin i'm going to be that I'm, I'm maybe even a rogue if i can pretend to be sneaky i don't know whatever but I ended up being a caster. And not only that, every time I'm asked to be in a game, people are like, can you bring a sorcerer or a wizard? Because we like, <laughs> so I've actually <laughs> fallen into like, I, my, I, I'm wizards in most of my games, but I, my favorite, favorite for some reason is, is being a sorcerer and I love wild magic. <laughs> Oh, it's so good. We have a wild magic sorcerer in one of our Dimension 20 campaigns. It's just an impossibly fun subclass. It's just so, because it kind of hits that thing you want from a sorcerer, I feel like, which is the opposite of a wizard who is all like technique, study, precision, you know, diligence. I know everything. I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> Tell on the other side of like, look, I can do some pretty incredible shit. I got no idea how it works myself. <laughs> Barely had control over it. If you ask me to do something, just heads up, it could go horribly wrong. It's just such a wonderful counter flavor to the wizard. It's like it's almost like the ideal sorcerer is the wild magic sorcerer. Um, and like, I, it's sort of like it allows me to play like a character. I have a halfling, and she's coming into her uh, her her powers as a, as a, as a sorcerer. And she has a lot of power and being a wild magic sorcerer is sort of like, okay, I'm getting ready to cast this strong spell. Let's see if, and then you roll it and she turns into a potted plant. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. So it really yeah. totally fits like the character. So it's fun. Yeah. It's just been, it's been fun to play. <laughs> I love that so much. And I think, well, there, there's something great there too, because what you just said there is something that I think uh, is is a great piece of advice across the board, which is to encourage people to take the elements of the game that are kind of like the game, meaning the dice, the numbers, the mechanics, the rules, 
and find ways of interpreting them into your character's story. Like these things are never random, right? It's like, I'm this young halfling, I'm a wild magic sorcerer, trying to get get the reins on my magic. I've become a potted plant and saying like this, <laughs> It's like, yes, that story beat is determined by the dice, but how does it play into the story of this character? <laughs> I tried! I, uh, <laughs> I, the people are like, and all of the, the people in the game like, oh no, here we go. And then Dan's like, I'd like you to roll the deep. <laughs> I'm like, oh, because <laughs> the DM has the right to ask every time you cast a spell to roll the to roll the D100. So yeah. They may say it, she may say it, it just depends on where she feels, but that's usually, that's when the wild magic part does come out. And the, when we stream those games, the, the audience does like that part. They like watching it. <laughs> I love that so, so much. Well, it's great too, but I love, I love that thing you said too, which is like, I feel like people do have this thing of, here's what I thought I was gonna wanna play, or I was going to play all the time. And then here's what I actually ended up playing. Because for me, I kind of had the reverse of so often being like, um, like, oh, I w I'm going to be a wizard. I'm going to be some some kind of like wizardly intelligent spellcastery. And I, so often I end up in martial classes, specifically paladins. I love playing paladins. Really? Yeah, yeah, I end up doing your favorite. Oh. I I do. I love. I, there's something. Well, because I think that there's something um, very helpful about paladins because there's something almost built into the class that explains why this person is doing all this ill-advised shit like why are you going into a dungeon looking for trouble why it's such a bad idea to have come here in the first place and to be someone who's like i have come here to help like it's <laughs> is, is very like there's a it it, 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 it kind of like uh, facilitates the adventure to have someone who's like, look, I'm a warrior. I, I have taken oaths of heroism and devotion. Like, it's not any surprise that I would be here helping these villagers, going to this dungeon, trying to stop this evil, you know, necromancer, whatever. Like, this is this is my bread and butter. Now that's not to say that other things aren't also great. I definitely have played rogues as well. But when you're playing a rogue, I feel like a lot of times you're like, why, why am I helping all you people? This seems very, <laughs> this seems like Wait, I could be making all, yeah, what's in this? <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, I love that so much though. Um, uh, but you, you have that, so that fun thing of like the barbarian that you first played in TJ Storm's thing. And now you're playing like, oh, you said like multiple like wizards and a sorcerer and stuff like that. Um, do you, uh, uh, do you find that like mostly the class is still bringing you the same joy of the game? Or do you feel like it's almost like these are really different game experiences depending on the class you're playing? Like, do you do you find yourself like almost scratching a different itch depending on the type of character that you're playing? Oh, totally what you just said. It scratches, a I, I usually try, I usually look at, first of all, the, the adventuring team comp. Like what is everyone else playing to see? Like maybe, I like, I like filling in holes a lot. And Thanks. then whatever kind of adventure it is. Um, and then picking the character from there. And then I, I, I re for me, at least, I know it's different for everybody, but for me, when I've, when I've chosen the right character for what we're playing, I tend to have the most fun because I act the most organically. Um, a few weeks, like about three or four weeks ago, I played this thing um, for charity. It was, it was basically a battle royale. And mm -hmm. it's something that is really um, abnormal because the... 5e, the game, D&D itself as a game is not really mechanically built for players to play against each other. Yes. <laughs> the game true. is meant to play against, you know, the environment or NPCs. So we were doing something where it was, you had five players in an arena, um, one DM, and everybody was a level 20 of whatever they wanted to be. Whoa. And it was, go <laughs> to the death. Go to the death. So there are a lot of things that I think if they do it again, they'll have to change because they just don't work. They don't yeah. work in the mechanics of it all. But I decided I was going to be a paladin because yeah. smite all the things. <laughs> <laughs> and angel wings. <laughs> <laughs> different. I was like, look, if we're going to be gladiators in arena, it's like, are you not entertained? 
Paladins go in first and hard, and that's what I was going to do. <laughs> so choosing a paladin for that particular thing with a she was a goblin with a with paladin with a big huge personality. It worked for me. Like yes. I love seeing it. <laughs> I love oh a goblin paladin. But first of all, a very savvy mechanical choice for a battle royale. I feel like paladin in terms of classes, they're a pretty stacked class. They do well in combat. And then, oh, that's so cool. Just a goblin paladin <laughs> wrecking house. I love it. Um, uh, that is so fun. Um, uh, I feel like we have time. Maybe hopefully we have time for like one or two others. Um, uh, uh, I, had, I have one right in front of me here. Um, bu -bu -bum. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, this one's from uh, Jared uh, Warnke. Uh, thanks, Jared. Um, well, uh, wanted to ask you about incorporating character backstories into the main story better. Uh, sometimes my players will come with a prepared character and generic backstory. Uh, how can I better engage them in role-playing moments? Uh, thanks, Jared. Um, uh, so, uh, Alicia, I feel like like you've had uh, uh, some experiences that probably required more characterization and less. Like in a battle royale, uh, hey, talk is cheap. We're not here to be bandying <laughs> words. Let's get down to brass tacks. But obviously in a more narrative campaign, um, who the characters are as people is a lot more, uh, uh, you know, has a lot more to do with how the story is going to unfold. Um, what has your experience been like with character backstory? Are you a fan? Are you not a fan? Do you like a lot? Do you like a little? What are kind of your preferences and thoughts on character backstory? This is actually one of the most rewarding parts. I mean, every part of the game is freaking rewarding, but this part of the game is truly fun for me. Um, you think, I think, I think there's, I mean, what do they say? Like every D and D player has like a, um, a backlog full of characters. I'll never get to play. Oh, it's, it's so true. I literally have it right here yeah. next to me. It's heartbreaking. It's a huge stack. Of You'll be in the shower and all of a sudden you'll just start voicing the character. Like, Oh, that's a character. Write it down in your little character notebook. Mm -hmm. I, love I sit down with my character and then I, I literally start coming up with um why the how the why the why they act the way they are where they're from what they look like um you know what their families were like do they have siblings and that to me is so much fun and I always send it to like my little one sheet or two pages or whatever to the dm so that they the dm can decide if maybe they want to bring in some npcs that touch on what I what my character's going through. Um, a lot of the games I've played, I've only actually played one game that's had a session zero where everybody comes in with their character and talks about who they are. But yeah. every other game I've gone to, I guess we people have just we've just sent our backstories to DM. And what you realize though is do not send things to your DM that you don't want to show up ever because I've actually done things where I've said, I'm like, no, he used it against me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is funny to be like, hey, you're the person who controls all my enemies. Here's all the little things I care about. Can you hold on to these? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, why did you do that? I got yelled at once from an NPC for something that like I told the DM that I was about and I'm like, oh. <laughs> That 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 was wow. That was deep. You hit me hard there, man. You know, like you told me off in the game, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't just get like that. But I do think for you as a player, like Brandon was saying, if it's a one shot or if it's uh, like kind of like a specialty thing, um, a huge long drawn out backstory is not really going to. You're not really going to have time to play it out. But but in terms of a campaign and other characters in the game, if everybody kind of has like a backstory. Um, I think it's, I, I really think it adds to like the, the breadth and the texture of the game. And as far as the other people in the game knowing your background, you can either tell them or let it just come out organically, you know? I think, I think that's so true. And I love, I mean, the word texture is really what it's about. Because again, whether the DM has your like arch rival from your backstory or your long lost <laughs> sister or whoever else, you know, like, if the DM uses it, great. If they don't, great. But you knowing it, honestly, it goes back to like, you know, we're talking about neuroscience and psychology and stuff earlier. For me, I don't really know how to play a character without some idea of, 
it, it's not and again it's not like backstory is is what's motivating you in every single moment you go up and you're like hi sir i see you're running a sandwich shop can i get a sandwich and they're like my father gave me this sandwich shop when he <laughs> passed uh, when i was a young boy it's like dude that's not how people behave but what is true is that in real life people are a product of their past and where they are in their life is a product of the story that brought them here. So for me, it's hard to get into the emotionality or mindset of a character. Be, uh, be, it, it's almost like this, right? Like good characters are in motion. And if you have a character with no past, they're not in motion, they're totally static. Because, you know, it's like, as a baseball is thrown through space, you see its traje trajectory. You see where it came from, and that is determining where it's going. For me, a character is the same way, where if I don't know where they came from, I don't know their velocity, I don't know their inner emotional life, I don't know where they're headed to. Um, mm -hmm. Those those backstory elements, exp it, it's again, it's not that backstory is important just for backstory. It's what Alicia said, it's texture. Your backstory lets you know, okay, I was in this shipwreck and my life is hard and things are bad, which means that when I'm interacting with people, I'm coming from this defeated, pessimistic place. It's not, the past isn't just about the past, it's about the present and therefore mm -hmm. your future. Um, That's right. It's how you learn what, what drives that character. And for people who hear what Brennan's saying or what I'm saying, and they're like, oh, well, I don't know how to like write a backstory. Um, the PhD actually has awesome tools to help build that, to help build, like, what do they call them, bonds and yes. flaws. So you can, if you don't really know how you want it to, you can kind of say, oh, um, I am a noble, but I believed myself to be on the same level with people. Or... I see myself secretly above everybody I'm around. And it helps to build a, their character's personality. <laughs> They're great tools. It's really, they are like, because again, for people that don't have that performance background or creative writing background, like these are great tent poles for you to start that are going to make a character feel more lived in as you begin to move through that world. Um, yeah, those bonds, those ideals, those flaws. Uh, and what I like about those things too is it starts to give you some complexity where it's almost inviting you to be like, hey, everybody's got their ideals, but then they've also got their flaws, right? Like, like if you just have one of these, we're not really getting the full picture uh, of this complex three-dimensional person, uh, which is what we're all sort of aspiring to be. Um, exactly. Um, uh, oh, I love it. Uh, let me see here uh, real quick. We I think we have time for one more. Uh, this one's from uh, this one's from Sam. Oh, this is a, uh, a fun one. Sam, uh, I just started DMing my first campaign a few weeks ago. Congrats, Sam. Uh, Yesterday, I had a 3.5 hour session plan that wound up being cut short because my players plowed through all of the encounters much more quickly than I thought they would. Should I be preparing more scenes and encounters? Uh, how do you handle situations where players are moving through the story more quickly than you anticipated? Ooh, this is a great question, Sam. Um, first of all, everybody's got permission as a DM to just look up and be like, uh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna end it there for the night. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's allowed. You are allowed to do that. Um, uh, you know, the, I, I here's a funny story. I used to play this campaign called Storm City where I was a DM. We would play for like 18 hours in a row, truly like marathon sessions. And at a certain point, I would be like, guys, I need to go to sleep. And the, the, my players would stay up in character talking while I was asleep, being like... Oh yeah, they, it's so funny, right? So like, if you if you want to like, I even think you can say like, cool guys, we've reached the end of my dungeon. Um, it, but if you guys want to want to play a scene as you go back to town, I'll just be here, um, uh, like sketching out like what the next thing is going to be. I've done like mid session prep before of like, guys, we need a twenty minute timeout. While I, like you guys went to a place I didn't prepare for or anticipate, um, uh, let me, give me a second. I'm gonna come up with some names and some other stuff, and then we're gonna jump into this. Completely legal. That is allowed. Um, totally. I, I've, I've totally had DMs like um, say, well, like, cause I, you can when often when you're in a game, you you know we're looking at the DM and we see you guys' minds working. We see the smoke coming out, saying, okay, <laughs> you. 
you, okay, you walked in this tavern, but, and I can see sometimes when we've gone too far off course or we're about to where the DM, I probably need to take a break to like, I guess either rewrite or re sort of reconfigure things, which is totally fine in players. Like as a player, I like it because it gives me an opportunity to go back into my spell book and go, if we come up against something, what can I use? What can I do? Or to like, like Brandon was saying, talk to the other players about, okay, we were in this field. Do we take a short rest? Do we eat? Do we want to keep heading toward the city to find the lost, whatever? Do we want to, like, and we, as players, we like that, that few minutes to sit and talk too. Definitely. I, yeah. And also, hey, breaks are great. Take a break. Everyone go get a drink real quick. You know, like you can, like you, you are human beings first and you do not have to feel that you have this incredible pressure as a dungeon master to be like a living video game where it's like, oh, the DM's broken. We got like, like the world is glitching. We can't go to this new place. It's like, you're a human being. Um, using video games as an example though, what I will say too is one of the things I like to do that I think often means you, you don't have to break early is to world build or prepare in this way for for almost like stages, right? Like let's say you know that your players are gonna get in a boat, go across the ocean, go to this dungeon, it's the next big thing. You know that that dungeon is not prepped, right? What you can do is make sure that when you're prepping this like port city that everybody's in, that you can go, okay, I know I don't have that dungeon ready. Um, I'm gonna prep a little bit of this port city and we're just gonna have a little bit of an adventure here. Like for example, think about like you get, you get to the end of the session and they're like, great, we fin like they finished everything in 30 minutes. They're like, great, we ordered a ship, we're ready to go, we're gonna go to the dungeon. What I might do in that situation is introduce some complications in the city that I already know about. So I'm like, actually the Thieves Guild shows up and they have a problem with you chartering this ship. They're like, hey, you gotta pay an extra price to go on this ship. Because I know that improvising one Thieves Guild leader and a couple of his lackeys is gonna be way easier than improvising a dungeon. And if a fight breaks out on the docks, it's not that hard to go, here are some docks on a battle map. Squeak, 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 you draw your marker on them. <laughs> Here's some docks, let's have a fight. Real quick, you yeah. can just go and be like, uh, uh, you know, here's some bandits, here's some other stuff. Like, <laughs> and and thinking of your world as these stages where it's like, okay, um, as long as my PCs are in this city, I know who the Thieves Guild leader is, I know who the Merchants Guild is, I know who the, the queen of this realm is and all this stuff like that. Anywhere they poke around, like, I'll never run out of stuff because they're kind of in this little sandbox where I know enough about this stage of the adventure to be able to improvise something on the fly as long as they don't go past this little stage. We're kind of like in Final Fantasy where it's like that you can run around this area of the world map as much as you want, but, to, but we're just not gonna move past this little unlockable area. Exactly. Like even when you're playing like World of Warcraft, it's like a big sandbox. Like if your character is not meant to move out of a certain area, you will get shot and killed by an NPC. Like immediately. Because I used to try it. I used to be like, I'm if I'm gonna go over here in World of Warcraft, and I would immediately get shot dead. I'm like, that's how they keep me in here. That's how they do it. I'm doing a corpse run back to my corpse again. I'm like, that's how they do it. So, you know, I think that's probably what a lot of DMs, DMs do that. Like, we'll be like going to a city and then all of a sudden we'll see like, is that a surface drow walking on the street? Yeah. Why? Why would there be a drow? Oh. So then like I can, the DM probably threw them in and they slow us down. There are a lot of little tricks like that of being like, ooh, I need to, I need to do something. Because again, I think one of the hardships is, is, you you are gonna have to improvise. There are times as a GM where you're just gonna have to pull a rabbit out of the hat. The, the trick is remembering that some stuff is easier to improvise than others. You've done a lot of work making this city or this ship or this whatever. You have maps for it, you know it. Cool. Ha improvise something that'll make your life a little bit easier. If you need them to stay on the ship, Rather than being like, um, we can't go to the sunken city because ac because actually um, reasons and your PCs go, oh, this GM <laughs> didn't draw this. We we moved too fast and they got to the sunken city. <laughs> it's much rather than doing that, which kind of tips your hand and says, I'm out of stuff. 
improvising some awesome merfolk coming up and being like, hello, friends, I'm an undersea apothecary. I have a lot of potions to sell. Would you like some potions? Because then all you have to do is like improvise one character and some potions they can sell. And that scene could last 45 minutes as your PC is like, oh my God, I want dope potions. And suddenly it doesn't look like you've run out of stuff. You're just being clever about realizing that a tiny little bit of improv can do a whole lot of work. Such good advice. <laughs> you know, because I think we forget, you know, and I think as a DM, I might have, I might have forgotten, and so I'm really glad you're. I'm learning so much here. <laughs> but D, you know, D and D is yes, it's all about, you know, you have dungeons, you have combat, you have fights and stuff. But I, you know, role playing itself is what the game is. So even just, oh, let's sit down in this tavern and talk to some of the locals and, you know, get some primrose ale and find out if there's any, you know, even just talking and like, you know, singing and hanging out in the bar is an hour. <laughs> yeah, that stuff is fun. And it does, it, it takes up that time. So making room for that, I think is wonderful advice. Um, my goodness, we're out of time. I can't believe I can't believe it. Uh, what a true joy and honor. Alicia Marie, thank you so much for being with us today. <laughs> and I wanted to say one thing about people who, if anybody has any doubts whether or not they should play d and I will tell you this community, I mean, nothing's perfect. Nothing's ever perfect. But I will say this, this community has been extremely opening, loving, and supportive to new players. And unlike a lot of genres that I exist in, which is many, this one, especially they love like the new players bringing in new fresh blood and new ideas and stories. And there, there's no reason to, to not just try it. Just try it. Exactly. Try <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Wonderful. This has been Adventuring Academy. Uh, thank you again to Alicia Marie. Can't wait to uh, uh, check out. Again, uh, uh, make sure to go and check out her streams. Uh, you can find Fabled42 on Twitch, Damsel's Dice and Everything Nice. Uh, and of course, <laughs> uh, from all of us here at Dimension 20, wishing you breaking legs on that first hey. DMing outing. Hell yeah. Yeah, I can't wait. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I fill you in when I do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me let you know how it goes. This is us on Adventuring Academy saying see you next time. Farewell. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.